Ratio analysis looks at the financial accounts of a firm and makes calculations to determine their performance and financial stability. And it can also be used to judge the wisdom of future investment decisions alongside investment appraisal data. So we're going to look at seven different ratios here. Some profitability ratios, including gross operating and net profit margins. We'll look at return on capital employed. Liquidity ratios, which include the current ratio and the acid test ratio. And then finally, we're going to look at the gearing ratio. And we'll start off then with profitability ratios. So we've got these different types of profit then working down our income statement. And clearly that's really, really important for a business to look at their figures for how much profit they're making. That's really going to be the key objective for most businesses is going to be to increase their profit figures. But the problem with looking at just absolute profit figures is that it's quite difficult to make comparisons between different businesses at different stages in their life in terms of their performance based just on their profit figures. Because we look at this business and 2020, they made £15,000 net profit. Well, is that good? Well, we don't really know until we've looked at the size and the type of business it is. If it's a very, very small business just starting up, then that's not too bad potentially figure for, for profit. Whereas if it's a huge, great big multinational company, then that would be pretty disastrous to be only making 15,000 pounds profit. And so what we then do is we say, okay, let's have a look at the profitability of the business, which is how effective a business is at making a profit relative to its size. And then we can then start to make more clear comparisons between different businesses. So when we're looking at profitability, we calculate something called our profit margin. And for our profit margins, we basically take profit as a percentage of the revenue earned. So we could do that for gross profit, operating profit or net profit, take it as a percentage of the revenue earned for that business. And so the formulas therefore are going to be for the gross profit margin would be gross profit divided by revenue times 100. The operating profit margin, operating profit divided by revenue times 100. And for the net profit margin, you'd be doing your net profit divided by revenue times 100. And so in this example of an income statement here, for our gross profit margin, we'd be taking 60,000 divided by 150,000 times 100. So our gross profit margin would be 40%. For our operating profit margin, 20,000 divided by 150,000 times 100 to give us 13.3%. And for our net profit margin, we're doing 15,000 divided by 150,000 times 100, which would be 10%. So those were our profit margins for 2020. Equally, we could calculate the profit margins for 2019, and then we could make a comparison between the two as well. But then once we've calculated those figures, we could make clearer comparisons between businesses of different sizes to have a look at how effective they are at turning that revenue into profit. Our last profitability ratio is the return on capital employed. And this shows the percentage return that can be expected from all of the investment that's gone into the company. So we're really asking for every pound that goes in, how many pence do we generate in the form of operating profit back in return? And to make this calculation, we need to draw on information from both the balance sheet and the income statement. So the balance sheet, which looks like this in full, um, but we only need that last section of the balance sheet, which we've cut out at the bottom here to combine with the income statement to make our return on capital employed calculation. And that calculation is to take the operating profit, which appears in the income statement, and divide it by the total capital employed in the business and multiply it by 100. Now, the capital employed, the total capital employed is found by adding together total equity to non-current liabilities. And the reason for this is because any long-term funding for a business has got to fit into one of those two categories. We could have share capital, which would come under total equity. We could have retained profit, which would come under total equity, or we could fund the business through loans, in which case it would come under those non-current liabilities. And so if we just calculate the return on capital employed for the two years that we have in our financial statements here, for 2019, we'd be taking the operating profit of £40,000 
and we'd be dividing that by the total equity added to the non-current liabilities to make £150,000, multiply that by 100 to get our return on capital employed of 26.7%. For 2020, we'd be taking our operating profit of £20,000, we'd be dividing that by total equity plus non-current liabilities to make 175,000 times 100 to make 11.4%. Now it's probably worth noting that quite often this non-current liabilities figure might appear in brackets on the balance sheet as a negative. It's really important we don't take that away from the total equity in our formula. The brackets are showing us that it's a liability, but we shouldn't minus that as part of our return on capital employed calculation. In terms of interpreting that figure, there's no concrete good figure we're looking for for return on capital employed, but we would want it to be significantly higher than any interest you could get um, in return for putting money in the bank. Um, and also the higher it is, the better. In this case, we would be pretty concerned about return on capital employed falling by so much between 2019 and 2020. So I've just shown you the full balance sheet there, but really actually for liquidity, we only need to be concerned with this middle section here covering the current assets and the current liabilities. Because liquidity is about how easily assets can be converted into cash. So if we talk about a liquid asset, we would say that's an asset that can very, very easily be converted into cash quite quickly. So cash would, itself would be the most liquid of all the assets. When we talk about a business's liquidity position, we're talking about how stable they are in terms of their short-term financial stability. So can they pay those short-term debts that they might owe to people? And the way that we would judge that is by looking at the ratio of these current assets to the current liabilities. And um, there's two ratios which we'd use in order to calculate our liquidity position for a business. So the first of those is the current ratio. For that ratio, you would, that you would take your total current assets and divide it by the total current liabilities. Okay, simple as that. And so for this business here in 2019, we would take our current assets of £18,000, divide it by our current liabilities of £18,000. And so our current ratio for 2019 would be one to one. So you can see it's in that format of a ratio. You can just put it in the format of one. So you could just say that business current ratio is one, um, or you could write it out in full one to one. In 2020, you can see the total current assets now £22,000 and the total current liabilities are £17,000 and so we would say that the, the current assets 22000 divided by 17000 would be 1.3 to 1. So in terms of what we're looking for with our current ratio, clearly we want to have more current assets than current liabilities because these are things that we owe in the short term and if we've got more current liabilities than current assets, then where are we getting the money from to pay them? So we want to have more current assets than current liabilities. And so we want this ratio to definitely be more than one to one. And generally speaking, we'd lo be looking for a figure in the range of 1.5 to two to one to be quite safe there in terms of being able to pay those short term debts. We wouldn't want it to go too far beyond two to one, because if we've got lots and lots of things in these current assets, then we sometimes say that we're not making our assets sweat enough because we're not really doing very much with these assets. If you've just got lots and lots of cash sitting in the bank, then why not use that to expand your business and expand more premises, more machinery, which is going to produce more out output and be more profitable for the business. So that's kind of the range we'd be looking for with our current ratio. We could also then look to an acid test ratio, which is another measure of liquidity, but it's kind of even more short term. Can we really meet our very um, short term liabilities um, very, very quickly and very easily? And so all we're doing there is we're taking the current assets and we're minusing stock from them before then dividing them by the current liabilities. So in the case of our business here, 
2019, we'd be doing 18,000 minus the stock of 10,000 divided by the current liabilities of 18,000, which would give us 0 0.44 to one. And then in 2020, we'd be doing 22,000 minus the stock of 20,000, um, so that'd be 2,000 divided by the current liabilities of 17,000 to give us 0 0.1 to one. So that with the, the acid test ratio, the idea we'd be looking for could be a little bit lower because we're removing stock from that equation. So we can afford for our acid test ratio to be a little bit lower, but we we'll still be looking for a ratio of around one to one for our acid test ratio, showing us that we can still pay those short term, those current liabilities. So for this business, I would say actually that is, would be really concerning if they were in that position. Only 0 0.1 to 1 would be showing they were having some quite severe liquidity problems. And you can see that from the fact that they have got zero cash in 2020. So, you know, where's that money coming from in order to pay back those that have lent the money in order to pay back that overdraft? They're going to be struggling to do that when those things that they owe fall due. Our final ratio is the gearing ratio, and this shows the proportion of a business that is funded by long-term borrowing. And the formula we use for calculating that is to take non-current liabilities, we divide it by cap capital employed, which is total equity plus non-current liabilities, and we multiply it by 100. So it's quite a similar formula to return on capital employed, but rather than operating profit as a percentage of capital employed, it's the non-current liabilities that appears at the top of the formula. And so that might seem a bit strange for it to appear at the top and at the bottom of the formula, but you're working out long-term loans as a percentage of the money invested in the business, and that money invested includes long-term loans. So we can work that out for 2019 and for 2020. In 2019, we'd find the non-current liabilities here, £40,000, and we'd divide it by total equity, plus non-current liabilities added together, they make 150,000 pounds multiplied by 100, which gives us 26.7%. For 2020, we do the same calculation, but here our non-current liabilities are 50,000 pounds, and we'd add that to the capital employed, which is the total equity plus the non-current liabilities, which makes 175,000 pounds times 100, which gives us 28, 0.6% for our gearing figure. Now there's no cl completely clear cut figure for good and bad gearing, but it's generally accepted that once you go over 50%, then that starts to become a concern because it means that more than half of your business is funded by loans and that could make you very vulnerable to any changes in interest rates. If interest rates were to go up and gearing is up above 50%, that's going to have a really big impact on the cost of servicing these loans. Now, the other side to that is if gearing's too low, it shows a bit of a lack of ambition in using loans to expand. Businesses operate by taking out loans, using this money to generate a greater return than the interest payable on them. And if you've got very low gearing, then that means that you are not trusting yourself to do this. And shareholders might rightly say, uh, why are you using only our money to run the business and not trusting yourself to take out any debt funding as well? All of these ratios can be really useful to us in assessing business performance. But because for the most part, there's not necessarily um, a clear figure for each one which represents a good ratio or a bad ratio, we really need a point of comparison for them. And so for that, we might want to compare to previous year's performance as we have been throughout this video, looking 2019 to 2020. We can then compare and look at whether the ratio is improving or worsening over time. We might want to compare it to a close competitor and see what the competitor's ratio is and make a comparison to that. Or on a similar theme, we could look at industry benchmarks because different industries are gonna have different figures uh, which would represent good prof uh, profitability or liquidity or gearing ratios. And so having a benchmark to compare it to could be really useful as well. The other thing that we might find ratios useful for is to help us make spending and particularly investment decisions. How are we going to fund those decisions? So to give a few 
examples. If we have very high gearing, that would suggest that taking out even more long-term loans might be unwise. That would leave us vulnerable to increasing interest rates. If we had very high liquidity ratios, that might suggest that we could use cash to fund any investments. If you've got lots of your resources tied up in cash, it's not really generating any return. So why not use it to fund more profitable investments? And if we've got very high profitability ratios, it might suggest we could use reserves, so a retained profit into the next year. And that's a really good source of funding because it doesn't um, require any interest payments or it doesn't dilute the ownership of the business either. For all of ratios uses, they do show quite a narrow picture of just quantitative financial performance. And you should probably look at a range of other qualitative factors before fully assessing business performance or making any decisions. So just to give a few examples, that might include things like sustainability, factors to do with ethics, corporate social responsibility, reputation of the business or customer satisfaction that you'd want to look at alongside those ratios. We'd also want to look at any reasons for positive or concerning ratios and investigate them before jumping to any conclusions. We might look at profit quality, for example, and that's about looking at whether the source of the profit is likely to continue into the future. So we might have one huge one off sale that's really pumped up profitability ratios quite artificially in one year. Um, and we might be expecting that to fall quite significantly in the future. So we wouldn't want to set too much store by high profitability ratios in that example. And we can also talk about window dressing. Uh, which is where the people preparing the accounts might actually have a vested interest in the company looking good. And so they might move some items around and just be a bit creative with reporting uh, to make performance look better than it is.